Are you on the market for Raspberry Pi? Well, you may not know, there are some SBC mini PCs that can outperform them at the same price. I know, it depends what you do with it. Welcome to Team Pandora. Subscribble. So this here is what came through the post. It's a package from Yu Yitu, and it was sent to us in purpose of this here video review. And inside this box, we've got plenty more boxes. For some reason in here, we have a smartphone stand, a steel case with screws, antenna for NFC, and a couple more for Wi-Fi with a chip. This one's the 8852BE, which is Wi-Fi 6. If you fancy a hand at debugging, we get a module for that. Definitely for the Tinkerers. Here's the main board, the UE2 X1. And they even threw in a touchscreen portable display. So here's what arrived. Well, let's get into the specs. The X1 is powered by a quad-core Intel N5105. It clocks up to 2.9 GHz, and while it's not the newest chip on the block, it's efficient, reliable, and capable for everyday tasks. This one comes with 8GB of DDR4, but what really sets it apart is a sheer number of ports, headers, and expansion pins. So for makers, tinkerers, and fans of embedded systems, this tiny board opens a door for a world of possibilities. So let's open her up. Ooh, hello. The board itself is much smaller than expected, and it comes with a power adapter. The switch and adapter is branded as UE2, uses the standard DC plug, and it outputs at 12 volts, 3 amps, to give a maximum of 36 watts. Outside these two items, nothing else in here. Taking a closer look at the X1, we can see it's a very small unit. Most of the top is being taken up by this heatsink, and at first glance, this screams tinkerer. On the side we've got MIPI, micro HDMI, SATA, a micro SD slot, and pinholes for more headers. On the rear we've got 1 gigabit Ethernet LAN, and ports for USB 2.0 and USB 3.0. Over here we have headers for GPIO, SBI, I2C, UART, USB, and headers to the speaker and LED. Moving to the front face now, we have a power switch, a 3.5mm audio jack, HDMI, two LED lights, as well as the power jack. Moving to the bottom, we have an M2 slot for PCI 3 before. This is where you put in a stick of NVMe for extra storage, and there's also another slot down here for Wi-Fi. If you're feeling creative, you can use an adapter to get yet more storage if needed. As for a size comparison against the Raspberry Pi, well, here you have it. The X1 is around 2 centimeters longer. Here's the 3B+. And as you may notice, the X1 doesn't need any extra hats, as all the headers are ready from the get-go. But before we put the case together, let's set the Wi-Fi module, over to the antenna, and give it some extra storage. Now, to get in the case. The only thing we'll need is a small posi screwdriver, and then just screw it in. Also need to use our fingers to mount these antenna bits by poking it through the hole, tightening it up, and then more screwy action. Looks like we're out two screws. No big deal, a trip to the hardware store can easily sort that out. Let's get them Wi-Fi antennas in place. So yeah, looks all right. But now it's time to test it out. Let's hook it up to a monitor, keyboard, speakers, and let's see what this thing can do. On first boot, we're greeted to the window setup screen. We need to go through the usual options, such as language, region, and keyboard settings. But unfortunately, we're not given the option to skip connecting to the internet. If we push Shift and F10 and type uberbe backslash bypass nro, the computer will restart, and then we have the option to skip this requirement. Either way, being forced to connect to Wi-Fi without the chance to check for tampering is a serious security risk. It'd be great if Microsoft took a smarter approach. So now to type in our username, give it a couple of minutes, and we're in. Looking at the background, it's clear that this install has been tampered with. Sure, manufacturers should include drivers, but connecting to Wi-Fi during setup still carries risk. You're basically trusting everything blindly, and without the option to skip, there's no way to verify. That's why installing the OS yourself is always a smart move. You know exactly what's going on from the start. 
That said, we tested the system using Windows Defender and Bitdefender, which both gave us the thumbs up. No malware here. Checking the System About page, we can see that the hardware checks out. Windows 11 Pro is installed, but if we check out the activation page, it can't connect. After hooking up to our Wi-Fi, we can see that this doesn't have a key associated with it, but if you wanted one, there's a separate version that you can order. If you want to go even cheaper than that, there are places where you can find them for around $10, or you could go the free route, with a bit of Linux. But as this system came with Windows 11 Pro on the 128GB eMMC, we'll update it to the latest version and see how it performs. As expected, Windows does run pretty well, handling everyday tasks like Office, web browsing, and watching YouTube without a hitch. At 1080p it's smooth and responsive, but at 4K, every now and then it'll be dropping frames. I wouldn't bother multitasking while using YouTube at this resolution. The small, onboard fan gets pretty noisy, with a sharp, high-pitched whine. The temperatures are a bit on the high side too. If there's a way we can lower these, we'll likely end up with a much quieter system. So we took out the board, removed the screws from the back, took off the heatsink, and... Ugh. They made a bit of a mess with the thermal paste, and checking the viscosity, the quality of this may be lacking. Just going to clean this up and replace it with MX6. Much better at idle, and it's hardly audible. Pulling from 8 to 9 watts from the wall. Under load, CPU raises to 73 degrees, and it makes the system a little louder. Now it pulls almost 22 watts. Then if we stress test both CPU and GPU, we're over 78 degrees, and it gets much louder. Enough noise, let's check benchmarks. First up, Geekbench 6, and performance-wise, it lands somewhere between the Raspberry Pi 4 and 5, but it has a few advantages. For example, the x86 architecture, and a more efficient integrated graphics chip that supports QuickSync. Either way, results are underwhelming when looking at the energy efficient processors we have today. It's some Time Spy, and a bit of Shizuku. It's not going to win any competitions with these scores, but we need to realize that this is eMMC, which could be upgraded if we use the quicker PCIe 3B4 slot. So now we're going to connect the controller via Bluetooth, and let's play some games. First up, Cuphead. Set to 1080p, this game looks like butter. Dave the Diver struggles at 1080p, and it's somewhat playable at 720. And here's a bit of Rocket League. We can get a game out of 720p at performance settings, but it's not ideal. As the X1's target audience are tinkerers, there's no surprise that the BIOS is packed full of juicy options. But for the regular Joe, I think it's enough to know that we can set up Secure Boot, and also fire up another OS, such as Badassera Linux. Badassera is essentially an emulation station running on Libra Elec, and we can see that the X1 is super compatible. I can connect to the Wi-Fi router, and also pair my controller via Bluetooth for some retro action. For example, here's Jim Power on the Amiga, running at full speed. Second 2 on the PlayStation. Or if you want something a bit more challenging, Tekken 3 in MAME. Arcade games like this can function much better using the x86 instruction set. And the same applies for Killer Instinct 2. And for games using the Sega Model 3. It's some good race. And if you'd like your futuristic races, Wipeout Pulse on the PSP runs fine. Getting back to that LCD display, let's give it a shot. Inside the box we get the display itself, a variety of cables, 
and a plastic back cover. But very much like the computer, no instructions are included, so we need to do some guesswork. So let's insert these cables and whack on this back cover. So far, so good. So let's whack on the stand and plug it up. But unfortunately, we do have an issue here. In order to use the ribbon cable, we need physical access to the bottom of the slot. Otherwise, we cannot clamp it into place. All we needed was the one cable, and we're good to go. The display gets detected in Windows as 1024 by 600. The refresh rate, much higher than we imagined, at 119.52, 120 hertz. Unfortunately, the colors fall a bit flat, resulting in a somewhat washed out image. But on the bright side, it features a touchscreen, opening the door to new ways to interact and navigate. I think it's about time for the pros and the cons. The UU2X1 is a tinkerer's dream. Its small size and multiple ports make it a great alternative to a Raspberry Pi, especially if you wanted to primarily use x86. However, it's difficult to recommend to regular customers when the hardware is rather dated. If UU2 can update this board with faster hardware, larger system fan, and maybe easier access to the case without need of a screwdriver, they're onto a winner. Summary. It's a tinkerer's dream, got ports for days. Larger than a pie, let's finish that phase. The X1's loud, the fan screams like dead, but it'll run your code if you're that kind of mad. Who codes the Joe Ho? Noisy, just like a new chicken's band. A great little board in a tinkerer's hand. Hardware is a little weak. The UE2X1 is for the ultimate game. Just a quick shout out to all of our amazing patrons. Seriously, you rock. Your support keeps us going, and we couldn't do this without you. If you want to help out, join our awesome crew on Patreon for less than a cup of cheap coffee. Every little bit helps. It is tea time. If you want a massage, just yell out. <laughs> anyway, this has been Imi Chicken of Team Pandori, and I'll catch you on the next one. Ta-ra. <laughs>